Intersectional feminism. It's all the rage on campus and on social media. But what is it? And is its new popularity a welcome development? That's coming up next on The Factual Feminist. Suddenly, intersectionality is on the boards. New stories are turning up everywhere. Well, intersectional theory was first developed in the 1970s and 80s by a group of African-American feminist scholars and activists. They accused the women's movement of neglecting black women and of basically misunderstanding oppression. Pathologies like racism and sexism, they said, these are not separate systems. They connect, they overlap, and they create a complex arrangement of advantages and burdens. So white women, for example, are penalized by gender but privileged by race. Black men suffer from their race but garner advantage from their gender. But black women are in double jeopardy. They are disadvantaged by both race and gender. Well, Patricia Hill Collins, a professor at the University of Maryland and former president of the American Sociological Association, she's one of the chief architects of intersectionality theory. The textbook she co-authored describes the United States as a matrix of oppression. And beneath this veneer of freedom and opportunity, there lies a rigid system of privilege and domination. Now, most Americans don't see it, but Collins and her co-author alert students to the fact that the true nature of their society has been hidden from them. In their words, dominant forms of knowledge have been constructed largely from the experiences of the most powerful. And the text promises to introduce students to deeper, subordinated truths. That's their phrase. And they, they say they're going to avoid Western and masculine styles of thinking, which can obscure these truths. Well, according to the theory, those who are most oppressed have access to a deeper, more authentic knowledge about life and society. In short, members of privileged groups, especially white males, should not only check their privilege, but they should listen to those they have oppressed, because those groups possess a superior understanding of the world. Now, initially, the primary focus of intersectional feminism was on black women, but the number of victims quickly multiplied. This graphic from a popular women's studies textbook includes 14 or 15 marginalized identities. The factual feminist is concerned. Now, there are social scientists who use a sensible, non-politicized version of intersectionality to understand complex social identities. I have no quarrel with them. What concerns me is how intersectional feminism is taught and practiced on the college campus. I have many objections, but I'm, I'm just going to limit myself to three. Problem one, it's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I mean, if intersectionality theory were merely a reminder to be sensitive to different kinds of social advantage and disadvantage, that would be fine, but it's much more than that. It's an all-encompassing theory of human reality constructed to be immune to criticism. If you question it, that only proves you don't understand it or that you're just part of the problem. It's seeking to correct. Now, that's why articles by skeptics almost never appear in textbooks like these. Now, certain groups, men, for example, are marked as sinners with a capital P. <laughs> and if they dare to question the theory, they will be told to check their privilege. Their job is to atone for their unearned advantages and to learn from those they have oppressed. Now, some men are really taking this to heart. Consider this tweet. As a dude who cares about feminism, sometimes I want to join all men arm in arm and then just run off a cliff and drag the whole gender into the sea. <laughs> Problem two, victim creep. According to this theory, victimization confers wisdom, moral authority, even prestige. So in places where intersectionalists gather on campuses and social media, there's now a mad scramble for victim status. Now, I first saw this theory in action way back in 1992 at the annual meeting of the National Women's Studies Association in Austin, Texas. Now, the conference organizers had imbibed the lessons of intersectional feminism, and they were struggling to honor all identities. So the participants were told to assemble in small groups based on their healing needs. So there were groups for Asian women, African-American women, elderly women, Jewish women, disabled women, fat women. None of these groups proved stable. The fat group polarized into gay and straight factions. 
Members of the black lesbian group could not get along. Those who had white partners were called out for their privilege and had to form a separate group. And new identities emerged. A group of women with allergies formed a caucus and issued a set of demands about not wearing dry cleaned clothing or hairspray. It was a conference of scholars, but we didn't resolve our differences through rational discussion. Instead, intersectionality created new reasons for anger and devoured itself. The conference ended with songs and healing rituals. Problem three, bullying. Intersectionality tells us that white males are in charge of the capitalist white supremacist patriarchy and that they enjoy most of the unearned privilege. So on many campuses, that has given marginalized victims permission to treat them badly. Ironically, members of the insider victim class now routinely do to others what they accuse the privileged class of doing to them. They stereotype, demonize, shame, and silence people. Now, what often happens with morally inflamed groups has happened here. They've begun to turn on each other. In 2014, The Nation magazine ran a story about a conference at Barnard College for feminist bloggers. Now, the participants were immediately denounced by a Twitter mob as a cabal of white opportunists, <laughs> and even though it included several women of color. The very act of holding the conference was considered discriminatory. It privileged people who lived in New York City and excluded indigenous women, mothers, veterans, women who are not online. The Nation magazine quotes a participant who compared it to a Maoist hazing. Now, such hazings are now the norm in the feminist blogosphere. Now, if you have wondered why there are so many millennials on campus telling people to check their privilege, demanding trigger warnings, calling people out for microaggressions, and retreating to safe spaces, here's my theory. They're in the grips of a conspiracy theory and have succumbed to the cult of intersectionality. Now, there are human rights catastrophes that bear directly on race and gender. Black male incarceration in the United States comes to mind, as does gender apartheid in many Muslim countries. But intersectional theory isn't uniting people around urgent humanitarian crises. It's dividing rather than uniting. It's leading large numbers of talented, idealistic students at highly privileged intersections of American colleges to focus on themselves and to enact psychodramas. It's turning them inward away from a world that needs them. Well, please let me know your thoughts on intersectional feminism in the comments section. Do you agree with my analysis? Am I missing something? If you found this video valuable, please show your support by subscribing to the series, following me on Facebook and Twitter, and thank you for watching The Factual Feminist.